Well, hi, and welcome to Spaminar, our monthly online gathering for live theater prop professionals and anyone interested in stage props. I'm Larry Heyman, Spam member and associate professor in props design and fabrication and a lecturer in the design program at the Oklahoma City University School of Theater. SPAM was formed in 1994 to create a fellowship among prop professionals to address issues co of common importance and to create a parity with other production areas. We're an association of professional prop educators and managers from nonprofit, sorry, not-for-profit producing organizations with an international communication and support network that shares resources, information, solutions, and tech techniques, as well as safety information, continuing education, and stock. We promote the highest standards among prop artisans and craftspeople in the field of uh, props to potential prop professionals, while working to establish educational standards for the training of prop artisans. We now have over 150 active members, reaching from Hawaii to Ireland to Canada to Florida. As with previous seminars, uh, we're requesting pay what you can pay what you can donations to help support this programming and our annual grants for early prop career uh, early career prop professionals. If you can afford to donate, the link will be in the chat during the session. And we truly appreciate anything that you can give. Um, We've enabled live transcriptions for this webinar. If you'd like to use them, click on the live transcript button on the bottom and then select show subtitle. Alternatively, you can click view full transcript to see it, see it in the meeting side panel. I am really excited about tonight's seminar. Tonight, Jen McClure will be talking with us about a wide variety of sculpting clays and media and their pros and cons. And I know that as an educator, one of the hardest things to teach my students is how do you pick the right thing for the right job? So Jen is gonna help us with that and I'm really excited about it. Jen is the property supervisor for the Yale Repertory Theater and Yale's uh, and the Yale School of Drama, I believe it's the Geffen School of Drama now, where she's been working for the past 14 years. She worked previously as the prop master and technical director for Alfred University, prop master for Mary Go Round Playhouse and New York Stage and Film, as well as touring with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. She's designed props and sets for uh, sets and props for the Yale Cabaret and the New Haven based A Broken Umbrella Theater Company. In addition to her work at Yale, she also works as a freelance properties artisan and notable projects include work for Hudson Scenic Studios, Walt Disney World, uh, musician Amanda Palmer, puppets for the string pullers and custom masks for the Palabolas Dance Company. Mrs. McClure holds a BFA from Alfred University. She's the author of Bloody Brilliant, How to Develop, Execute, and Clean Up Blood Effects for Live Performance, available at Amazon, a fantastic resource book. And when she's not in meetings, she enjoys mold making, masks, and puppets, uh, and sculptural projects that utilize her art training. I'll be your moderator for this evening. Um, if you have questions, please post them in the chat, and we'll pose them to Jen during the Q&A session following the presentation. Take it away, Jen. All right, hi everybody. We're back again in the Zoomiverse here. So uh, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. So as Larry mentioned, um, I have a, a BFA um, in sculpture and ceramics. And so any type of this material where we get to get our hands on something and push and pull some stuff around and get to carve and, or uh, sculpt something are some of the things that I really, really enjoy. That being said, there's a ton of different options for this stuff. So I'm gonna to touch on a little bit of these things, but the biggest thing that I wanna uh, uh, hit home here is that the best way to know what to use is just to try a bunch of stuff. And then you'll kind of know what works best for you, what works best for different projects. Some of the things that I love, some of my favorite sculptors hate. So it's not just a matter of the way that the materials behave, but also a matter of how do you work with them and what kind of works best for you. So let's get started right away. Okay, so we're gonna talk first um, about clays that you use not for final things. So this is things that you would be making for prototypes or potentially something that you're making a mold of. So uh, in props, we're often sculpting things that don't exist. 
And now in the world of 3D printers, you know, some people might be asking, why would you bother even sculpting this stuff? We have 3D printers, we can do that. Well, 3D prints don't always come out exactly the way you want them to. They take a little bit longer. Um, they sometimes need some finishing or some sanding on the surfaces. And truthfully, because my background is in, in sculpting, I can actually sculpt stuff faster than I can model it in 3D and get it off the 3D printer. So if you practice, you can actually be faster with this kind of thing and be able to be pretty efficient with just physical materials. So water-based materials are the first to talk about. So water-based clays um, are the first thing. So this could be a type of clay that you might make pottery out of where you would then eventually fire in a kiln, bake at a high temperature, uh, but they don't have to be. And actually uh, clays, water-based clays that are formulated for sculpting often cannot be fired in a kiln and, and baked hard. Those type of clays have a specific formulation that have the right materials in them to hold together, but there are water-based just sculpting clays. So that's what we're gonna talk about uh, now. So one of my favorite uh, sculpting clays is called wedge clay. That's W-E-D clay. And W-E-D stands for Walter Elias Disney. This type of clay was uh, developed by the Disney Corporation when they would sculpt small sculptures before they would do animation. So they would make sculptures of the characters so they could turn them around and basically make a small maquette of their, uh, of their figures. And so this clay was developed for that. It's uh, again, water-based, so it can dry out. You have to keep it hydrated, but it has a certain um, component of glycerin in it. So it doesn't dry out as quickly and it's really, really soft and smooth. So I'm gonna move you over here because my work table is way more interesting than my face. And we're gonna come on over here. So here's a little bit of wet clay. So look how easily I can smush and push this clay around and really kind of move it and really, really fast get pretty cool um, quick shapes with this. So the wonderful thing about uh, water-based clay is that it's really soft. You can add more water to make it really soft or you can let it sit out in the air and let it harden. Um, and, and that will actually make it harder. Uh, and then you can use tools or whatever, but I can just move this around so quickly with my fingers. So for doing something fast, this is a really, really wonderful clay. What also is great about uh, water-based clay is that it's really economical to purchase because once you buy a big quantity of it, I have a whole ton of this. So this is some of the same clay that is hardened. This I cannot move around and it's actually pretty crumbly. But if I added some water to this, let it sit for a couple of days, I could rework it into this. So this stuff really doesn't go bad. So once you invest um, uh, in it, you can, you can get it. Um, I see a quick question about molding. Yes, some of these can mold. And uh, I actually have a bag here of my old web clay. See all this black stuff on the side? That's mold. <laughs> so um, it can get moldy. So you can prevent this by spraying a little bit of Lysol into your clay. Um, or just, just keeping it in a better uh, container. So I have another airtight actual container of, of Tupperware that I put everything in that then uh, prevents mold. But you can put a little bit of Lysol into it and make it not be um, super moldy, which is you know not terrible. So let me just share my screen real quick and I'm gonna show you an example of one of the projects that I did with this. So this was a bust for a couple of years ago. We had to make a sculpture of um, a life-size bust of Rosa Parks. And they wanted the sculpture to still look like it um, had some work lines in it, some, some tool marks. So we left some of this in the surface, but this is all water-based clay. This took about a week to work. So when I wasn't working on this, I kept it covered with a plastic bag and then spritzed it with a water bottle to keep it wet. Um, but the, but again, super easy to work with and, and really great. The other nice thing about uh, this kind of thing is again, it's pretty cheap. It's about $24 for 50 pounds. Um, you do have to pay shipping on that. So you might get a little, uh, uh, you know, you might have to pay a little more in shipping, but if you can find this at a local store, that's wonderful. But um, this type of sculpture is great. And you can uh, hollow this out. You can start with a, with a hollow core, either made of tin foil or newspaper, or uh, tape and paper or a wire frame. And so actually the clay on this is only about an inch and a half thick, this isn't solid. So you can also be really economical with how much clay you use with that. 
So that's water-based clay, which I love. So if you're ever looking to purchase this, um, look, the, the wed clay, when you buy it at a store, is uh, called Laguna Clay. That's the brand, that, the company that makes it. And you're looking for EM217. That's what the actual uh, product is called. There's another type of uh, water-based sculpting clay that's also from Laguna called EM210. Um, that's just one of their other ones, but that doesn't have the glycerin in it that makes this water-based clay so wonderful. So again, this isn't great for permanent um, uh, things. So what we wound up doing was making a mold of that sculpture, and then here's the resin version that this wound up being. So water-based clay often used for kind of that initial step, but not for your final height. Okay, so then oil-based clay. This is again something that we're using while we're uh, sculpting something that isn't going to be our permanent thing. Let's come back down here. So here's a bunch of types of oil-based clay. So I have this bin labeled sulfur-free plastiline clay. I don't know if I'm flipped on your screens or not, but um, if you ever plan on doing any mold making ever in your future, I would highly recommend when you buy oil-based clay to make sure that it is sulfur-free. Um, a lot of mold making products can be inhibited, meaning they will not cure if they uh, come in contact with sulfur. So uh, there's a lot of these that have been formulated to not have sulfur so that we can then sculpt things and then use our, our mold silicones. Um, so these come in a couple different styles. This is a green version. This is a brand called Chavant. It's a French brand. Um, and this is their NSP, so non-sulfur plastiline. All of the names and links of these are gonna be in the uh, resource sheet that we share with everybody. So you'll have uh, all these names and also links to where to get this. So you'll notice that some of my plastiline has some chunks in it. This is plaster because I also use this for mold making. So I'm gonna show you some examples of how to use this just as a, a barrier sometimes as well. Um, but so there's a whole bunch of different brands of this. The other brand that I have are these big long sticks. This is a, a product called Sculptex from the, the Reynolds Advanced Materials Company who carry all of our smooth on products that we, that we love to use for mold making. So I've got these kind of separated because these come in different densities. There's a soft, a medium and a hard. And the Chavant clay also comes in a soft, a medium and a hard. So notice how I, I'm pushing pretty hard here and I can move this stuff around. It's kind of soft, but it's certainly not as soft as my water-based clay, right? Super squishy. So this takes a little more hand strength to really get into. And this is um, probably about a medium density. The soft, you can move around a little, a little more. And the hard, you really need to use tools to get into. But for certain projects, you know, you might be doing something that's got a lot of detail and you might want a harder base clay uh, to hold your detail a little bit better. One of the other leading uh, makers of a plastiline clay is this monster clay. And these are great. So this is a wonderful little kit and I put a link um, in, the, in the resources for this. But you can get this sample kit for less than $10. I think it's like $7.95 or something. And so this is their soft, their hard, their medium, and then also their uh, gray, which is kind of a, a hard. So this um, plastiline clay, sulfur free, very wonderful. Um, but what's great about this is that you can melt it. So uh, this could be melted and poured into a mold and then you can sculpt off of that mold. So you can heat this in a crock pot or like a wax burner or even just a double boiler and you can melt these down and pour them into molds and then sculpt off of that if you're trying to modify something that exists already. So these are really, really great as well. They're a little more expensive um, than the, the Sculptex or the Chavance, but again, you can use this stuff indefinitely. So let me just show you, this is a sculpture that one of my students did um, a bunch of years ago on a, on a plaster head. And this has literally been sitting in my props classroom for about 12 years. This is plastiline clay. It's pretty dusty, but if I wanted to get into this and use some tools, I can still rework this. So what's pretty cool is that you can leave this just out in the regular air. Again, it might get a little dusty and it needs to be washed off a little bit, but you can come back to these sculptures indefinitely years later. So that's pretty wonderful about this. And again, it, it um, stays and this doesn't get moldy. 
So let's just share real quick some of the things that we've done with plastiline clay. So here's a mold that I was making. This was a multiple part mold. And I separated all the parts with this plastiline clay and then used the clay as well to build a little barrier to hold my material in. And then the mold got made against this. And then I would have set up another little wall for the next piece to, to this to be butt up against. But so you don't have to only use this clay for actually sculpting final things. It comes in very useful in the mold making process for this kind of stuff too. And then one other thing to share. So here's a couple faces that I sculpted out of this plastiline clay. So I had to do a project where I had to sculpt uh, two actors' faces, but we couldn't take casts of their faces because they wanted their eyes and their mouths open. So again, you know, you might be able to, now we can scan people's faces and kind of 3D print a, a thing, but this was about 10 years ago where we didn't have that technology. So I started doing this with some epoxy putty, which we'll talk about later, but that dries so quickly and I wasn't able to get the detail that I wanted. So then I went into this with, uh, with the uh, plastiline clay. And so this is great again, because I could leave this open for a couple of days. So here's kind of the start of it. And then here's where we finished. So, you know, pretty close of a, an accurate representation of this actor. And then we made molds of these and cast these in silicone. But so just another example of kind of what you would use this plastiline clay for. All right, so uh, again, um, really great for mold stuff, great for your prototypes. So now let's get into talking about things that you're actually gonna use for your final products. So let's talk about some actual air dry clay. So the good thing about our sculpting clay is that it's not, it doesn't, uh, uh, it air dries, but you can rehydrate it. These are types of clays where when they dry, that's it. They're cured. They kind of have a gluey component to them that once they're set, that's it. Um, so here's just a couple examples. There's a ton of these though at the store. So what's great is these you can get at most craft stores. Um, Joanne, Michaels, Hobby Lobby, even Walmart and Target have different versions of these. So I would just recommend trying as many of these as you can until you find ones that you like. Um, some of them get a little crumbly as they start to dry. Most of them can be smoothed with water, again, because they're water-based. Um, some of them shrink a little bit. So these type of clays are really great for uh, freestanding sculptures or really small modifications. But when you're trying to do too much mixed media things, if the clay shrinks and the other things that you are putting it on do not, then you're going to get cracks. Um, so this DAS clay is one of the ones that I like that's just kind of a, a basic sculpting clay. And then one of my favorite air dry clays is this creative paper clay. Um, so what's wonderful about this, this has sort of a um, an off-white color, very, very soft to work with, but this has, as it says, paper clay. This has fiber embedded in it. I don't know that we'll be able to really see it, but as I kind of pull the edges of this apart, it breaks apart and these little feathered edges, I can, I can see that I can see the fiber, the paper fiber in this. So what's great is that you can use this and really smooth it out really, really thin and use this as a, like a top coat on a rougher sculpture and get this really thin, but because of the paper, it's really, really strong. This stuff is really porous, so it takes paint really, really wonderfully when it's done. And this stuff is really, really great. Um, so I love this as a, as a like final step when I'm refining a sculpture. Here's a little example of these little um, eye bags where this is like a plaster mask base. And then these little eye wrinkles were sculpted on here with some paper clay and blended in. And then here's another example. This was just a, a paper base. You can kind of see on the back that it's just a paper mache um, base, but I added these little bits of, of dimensional teeth that you can kind of see in this little bit of a bone just with the paper clay. And because this was made of paper, it really blended really nicely into all of that. All right. So now um, the one thing about most air dry clays though is that they dry and when they dry, they're rigid. So if you're using uh, this for something that needs to flex, maybe not the best thing. These are really great for things that are just gonna be static. Um, so masks that don't have to flex around too much. Um, these are really great. Also, this is super lightweight. 
so that's what's wonderful. Um, but you do have to work kind of quickly because once it's dry, that's it. All right, so next we've got polymer clay. Polymer clay, you may have heard of. It's Sculpey um, or Fimo, or these are clays that are, uh, they stay flexible and sort of like our oil-based clay for a long time. You can go back in and rework a sculpture made of this years later until you bake it. But these bake at a really low temperature so you can bake them in your oven. So for example, the uh, Sculpey, Temperature is 275 degrees, um, 15 minutes for every quarter of an inch of thickness. So often folks will make a little uh, tin foil center for what they're making if you're making something bigger and then try to just do um, a skin of an eighth of an inch or less. This can burn if you burn it or if you uh, uh, put it in the oven too much or if your temperature's too high. But, uh, and it can bubble a little bit if your temperature's too high. So again, if you haven't ever worked with this, very worth doing a test. This is kind of the, the very common, this Sculpey 3. Um, in this Fimo clay, there's this Fimo soft and Fimo uh, effects. But on the resource sheet, I, I posted a link. You'll see that there's so many versions of these now. There's flexible Fimo and flexible Sculpey. Um, this is a firm version of, of super Sculpey. So this is sort of the, the level up from just the regular craft stuff. This is like really dark gray. Um, and this is what a lot of like doll makers and things will use because it's very, very um, dense and, and holds detail really nicely. So here's an example. This is a, a head that my husband had sculpted. Um, and he worked on this for probably about a month or two. He would come back to it for a few hours um, uh, each night, but kind of keep working and working until he could get this really, really exact likeness, but was able to get this incredible detail in this, this small head with this uh, really firm super Sculpey. So that's pretty cool. Um, here's an example as well. So Sculpey comes in a ton of different colors. So like I'm showing these, you can get a huge rainbow of colors for these. So what's nice is that you can sculpt something and not have to paint it afterwards. So here's an example. These are some earrings that a friend of mine made a bunch of years ago, but one's a little sandwich and then one's a sushi, a little sushi go try to get mine, there we go. Um, so what's awesome is that these aren't painted. This is all just the colors of the Fimo or the Sculpey clay that are uh, just coming across in that. So granted, this is a little small for, for prop stuff, but if you're ever making um, like inset jewels or something on a, on a box or a necklace or something, you can use this to make those beautiful stones swirl the clays together and then not have to worry about painting them afterwards. So that's pretty great. This is also available at most craft stores. So you don't have to worry about um, going to a specialty supplier for most of these polymer clays. I would recommend that if you're going to be doing a lot of work with these, that you invest in or try to find at a thrift store or something, um, a dedicated uh, little toaster oven to fire these in. One or two times in your home oven isn't the worst, but if you're doing a lot of this, you know, you want to be careful about whatever's off-gassing in these, kind of getting into also the things that you eat in your life. So if you're going to be doing a lot of this, you know, pick up a, a, an old toaster um, from a thrift store and use that for this. And so that way you kind of have a clay oven and then you have your food oven. <laughs> uh, okay, so now um, next is foam clay. So this is kind of a new thing that I haven't played a lot with, but I'm pretty interested in it and it's very exciting. So these are coming uh, uh, onto the scene from a lot of our friends who work with cosplay. So our cosplay friends use this kind of EVA foam, this like floor mat foam. This is literally just a piece of old floor mat. Um, and so we, they make armor and all kinds of costume parts out of this. Um, but so now they've started making this foam clay. So these are just ones that I've gotten from a couple local craft stores. Uh, uh, but there's a couple other, you know, sort of name brands out there. Um, but so you can, once this stuff is cured, it's squishy, kind of like a marshmallow, um, and it flexes along with your, with your thing. So I did a couple little test pieces where I put some piece of this, this is still a little, little tacky, but um, you can smooth this with water. So I put some down and then it was sticky enough to stick to my foam here, but I still had to work at it a little bit. So I'll show you, let me pull this out. 
kind of is like marshmallow fluff, right? We're like, look how weird. Whoa, it's like kind of, you know, almost like silly putty. But if you tear it, it, you know, it's like that non-Newtonian business where you can just kind of snap it too. Um, but so super easy to work with, really, really fluffy, not sticky on your fingers. So it doesn't really get on you. So very non-toxic, which is really great. I can smooth this out pretty, pretty small. Um, and then if I wanted to put it onto my foam, I can use this to then build up some more organic shapes or fill in, fill in pieces and then smooth this around. So I've got a little cup of water over here. That if I wet my fingers and then get some detail in here, that I can get some nice sharp shapes with this and then also blend it in to my foam. So this is a pretty interesting way to be able to add some detail onto these PBA foam sculptures that we like to make. But another really interesting thing is that you can use this um, uh, and press it into molds as well, and then use these pieces to decorate other things. And you get these really, really lightweight pieces. So here's uh, some examples. Um, this is a some cured foam clay, so it's squishy. I can kind of still squish it and look, I can kind of bend it. If I bend it too much, it might snap, but it's still pretty flexible. So I could put this around something that was rounded or needed an edge or something, um, even once this is fully cured. So that's kind of cool to be able to keep some um, of these. This one actually had been in a round mold and when it was mostly cured was taken out and then kind of squished. So you can kind of play with when you remove it from your mold and then still modify it to get some, some harder shapes in there. Um, but that's pretty interesting to be able to maybe use these components. This was going to be like the eyes of a mask for one of my uh, former students. So that's very, very interesting to be able to add these details onto furniture or to um, things that need to fly and be lightweight. Um, or again, masks or puppets or any of that kind of stuff. So the, the and if you're, you're putting this into either... Um, if you're using a silicone mold, you don't need to use any mold release because this stuff is sticky. If you were putting it into a plaster mold, you might want to brush it with a really thin coat of Vaseline just so that it doesn't stick to the plaster. Um, but you can stick this stuff in bolts, which is really, really great. Okay, so another type of kind of squishy foam clay but that has kind of a brand name is this model. So we've known about this stuff for, for a while, but this stuff isn't as sticky as the, um, as the foam clay, and I'm sure there's other stuff in it. So this is a Crayola product. You can get this in white, or you can get this in a bunch of different colors. So again, kind of like our Sculpey clay, we love that you can uh, get this in a base color and not have to worry about painting it later. But what else is really interesting is you can mix paint in with this. So that's pretty cool. Um, so let's just tear open. These are some little sample packs that I got. Um, so you can get little packs of this or like big ones like this. And you can also get um, uh, a larger container that has like four of these packs in it if you needed a lot. We love this for fake food because it has that kind of marshmallowy, doughy feeling um, and uh, retains that. And is also, again, really, really lightweight. So it's, again, really great for mask making or uh, pieces like that. So here's a piece that's already uh, colored because this came in a, this was terracotta color. So again, kind of like our foam clay before, but less stringy. So when, even when I try to pull it slow, it doesn't do kind of that, that long pull that it's doing. It's not sticky on my fingers, which is really nice. It's not uh, bleeding any color onto my fingers either, because this is a thing that's made for kids. So, but left alone, this will, um, this will cure and will uh, you can't revive this. So you wanna use this um, as quickly as possible. One of my students last year or a couple years ago uh, for a fake food project in, in class took some white model magic, put a little bit of paint into it um, and then pressed it into uh, uh, a waffle iron. And so because this stuff isn't super sticky and the waffle iron was nonstick, they didn't have to use any release agent. And because they added the paint to this, you know, I'm gonna be really terrible and kind of break this, but the color's all the way through. It's not just on the outside. So they did double duty of just adding the color to it immediately 
And then they didn't have to worry about brush strokes or anything. And it really looks like dough. It looks really, really great because it's still got that softness to it. So this is again, really great for um, bread, fake food or, or anything like that. It doesn't stick super well to other things. If you were trying to use this as a mixed media thing, you would have to kind of make the piece and then adhere it to something with, a, with another glue, um, which you can do. So you could wrap this around something and kind of make a, um, you know, make a handle, um, but then you would probably have to take it off while it cured and then rewrap it back on or re-glue it or that kind of thing. But again, our fake food friends love to use this stuff. If you get this wrapped up quickly enough, you can keep the package and then you can um, uh, save the rest of it. But try to really keep these not in the air. So I would keep them in another plastic bag. Again, this stuff will dry out. It takes about 24 to 48 hours to really fully cure. So this is not a fast drying clay. So it's not great for making something uh, in the last throes of, of tech or uh, emergency notes. You really you do have to let it dry for, for a couple of days. Okay, uh, so those are uh, a lot of the main things. And then the last thing that we're gonna talk about is a huge, a huge thing is epoxy putties. Give me a second while I bring over all of these epoxy putties. These are some of my favorites. There are a ton of these out there. Okay, here's this one, here's this one, here's epoxy, right? So like these exist in a whole bunch of different, uh, uh, different stuff. So um, I would recommend as much as possible, get your, if you're interested in using these, get your hands on some of them and try them for yourself. Again, uh, they all kind of have just a slightly different feeling and it's really personal preference as to what one, um, what one you like. I'm going to grab some gloves really quick so that I can mix these up. So most of these, because they have an epoxy component, you should wear gloves when you're working with these. Um, some of them even have a little bit of a hard, harsh smell or a strong smell. So they're not terrible to use um, uh, in a regular shop, but I would recommend having a fan or a little bit of, of ventilation just um, uh, to, to not get a headache. Um, so my favorite is Magic Sculpt. Um, I like Magic Sculpt because it dries white. Um, and out of all of the ones that I've tried, I think that it's the least sticky when you're mixing it. And I find that when I'm using the tools, it really smooths really nicely. And uh, uh, I, can, I can really get nice tool marks in it. Um, and it's not, it, it's got a really good working time. It's working time is maybe about 20 to 30 minutes. So it's long enough to work with some things, but you really have to know what you're doing because uh, uh, if it's, the type of sculpture where you're gonna kind of play for a while, this isn't the, the best stuff. So this is really good for the final coat of something or when you're trying to fix something. So all of these epoxy putties are really great for any of the mixed media work that we do, which is so frequent in props, right? Where we like to uh, glue like weird plastics to weird metals and, and other things to other things. Um, so because these really don't shrink and because of the epoxy component, they're really sticky. So they like to, to adhere to lots of things and they bond really well and they're really strong. Most of these can also, when they're dry, be drilled or sanded or cleaned up and you can kind of really uh, uh, finesse them after their, um, after their cure. Um, and most of these are rigid, but there are a couple of products. I think Apoxy might have a flexible one, but there, there are some that exist that are, um, that are flexible. So Magic Sculpt really only comes um, in, in one style. I, I, at one point, I think they might've had a black, but I don't think they do. But you can get small, this is sort of the smallest container. There's an A and a B, and then this is kind of a big one, and then they have a gallon size as well. So most of these, because they have an epoxy component, they've got an A and a B component, and then you mix those two together. What I would also highly recommend is when you're using any of these kind of things to write on the lids what part they go with, because often they don't do that when you get them. And both of these lids 
um, you know, it would be really smart if they made one of these containers kind of a color <laughs> and the lid a different color, because if you swap the lids, then you're gonna contaminate everything inside of them. So let's look at what this stuff looks like. So it's basically one part is usually the, the actual resin. It's kind of the, the white color and then the hardener is sometimes a little gray. And you can kind of see on this one, there's a little bit of a, of a like brown or gold kind of top. Um, that's just because this has been sitting around for a, a little bit of time. Um, and this is a little bit hard to dig out because it's getting a little old, but if, unless you can't get into this at all, it's still workable, it's still good. Now, the smart thing to do would be to use one hand to dig out the one side and one hand to dig out the other or a tool or something, because again, you don't want to contaminate these. So I kind of dug in here with my one finger, so I'm going to dig in here with my other finger. And what you're going for are even amounts. So once I pull them out, I kind of want to see, is this about the same size? It looks like I've got a little more of the white one. So I'm going to take a little more gray. These don't have to be so exactly mixed though that they have to be um, weighed or anything like that. So that's really forgiving, which is very, very nice. So then once you have both parts, then what I like to do is kind of make a little snake. And then twist the two parts together and then crumple that all together and make another snake and just keep doing that until you get a uniform shape. Now, one thing that I should have done that I didn't do is that I forgot is sometimes when I'm working with stuff like this, I actually like to use a pair of gloves that's one size smaller than the normal size that I use because even when I'm doing this, my gloves are kind of bunching up on me a little bit, but it's not worth it to not use the gloves. <laughs> this stuff does make a little bit of heat when you're, when it's curing, but some of that heat is also coming from just you and your hands working it. So it feels like it's getting warm, but part of that is just uh, my working with it. So I'm almost there, but I can still see, it might not come across on the camera, but I can still see just a little bit of swirls in there. So what's nice is that because one side is kind of white and one is gray, that really tells you if it's mixed or not. And you wanna make sure that you get with any epoxy, like epoxy uh, glues or anything, you have a really good mix, otherwise it won't cure. Okay, so there we go. So now once I mix this up, if I were to leave this in just a big ball, it would start to generate heat and start to cure. And the more heat that it, that it makes, the faster it's gonna cure. So what I like to do is when I'm working with this is then kind of, again, make a nice long snake and distribute the material out so that it can't build up so much heat. And then I can work with small pieces of it and it won't cure as fast. So again, this stuff kind of is a little sticky. You might be able to kind of like, but it's not sticking to my gloves so much that I can feel that it's got a little bit of a sticky component. So if I were to take this mask base and put this onto here, it really kind of stays in place, which is very nice. You can smooth this with a little bit of water. So let's pull my water over here. You can also smooth this with um, rubbing alcohol if you would prefer to not use the water. But you have to be careful that too much water is gonna make it kind of gummy. Look at this nice uh, sharp line that I can get real quick. Right, so I've got a nice detail on there uh, already. I would be careful with using this type of thing on a mask or on anything that you need to be lightweight except for very small details. This stuff is not super lightweight when you start to uh, really pack it on there. Uh, it's really strong, but you have to be careful that you're not adding too much weight. So it's again, great for little details on stuff, um, but not so great for uh, a, like a full, a full mask or that kind of thing. This again, can be pressed into a mold. So get a little mold here. So I'm gonna press the remainder of this kind of into here. So I would recommend if you're using any of this kind of stuff, if you've got any, silicone molds around your shop or anything, you know, keep them handy because if you mix up a little bit too much, 
you can kind of press the rest into that and then you can you know have some of these little accents that you can add on to stuff later so these are hard um, not flexible but nice and easy instead of uh, having to carve these out of wood or again you know instead of having to carve this out of a uh, uh, make this on a 3d printer I'm getting these really really quickly so magic sculpt specifically I've got about like I said a 30 to 40 minute work time um, and then it really cures overnight within three or four hours you could move it around uh, but I wouldn't trust that it's fully fully cured until it sits overnight um, but here's some of the things that that's really good for so this was just a little uh, thing that I was kind of messing around with trying to play with different um, uh, materials so this is like a really flexible toy and this little flexible fin but I combined them with a little bit of magic sculpt in here so even though that's not flexible my joint where it glued itself to the plastics is really really strong and not bending even though these are flexible and it didn't shrink at all. Um, so that's really nice again for trying to add different materials together. Um, okay, so then there's a bunch of other types of these. So our favorite, our, you know, our smooth on company that makes our, our mold making supplies that we love has a product called Freeform Sculpt. So their Freeform Sculpt is very similar to the Magic Sculpt where it's got um, a part A, and the part B, again, kind of one is white and one is a little brown. I find this just a little bit more sticky, which isn't terrible, um, uh, but it, it does get a little, uh, you know, a little sticky. So this is like an hour and a half hot life. So you've got a little bit longer working time on this. So if you needed a little bit more time, this might be interesting. One of the other ones Smooth On makes in the same line is called Freeform Air. So I've got a whole bunch of this because this is great for sculpting with, but it's really doughy. It's um really fluffy. It's kind of almost like our model magic play. How funny, it's like really kind of crumbly until you actually mix it together. Um, but that's because it's so lightweight. So this you can use for masks. You can use this as a, um, you can carve whole masks out of this because it's so lightweight or use this for your detail. One of the things that I love this for is support shells on molds. So let's zoom back a little bit. So this is the mold for my Rosa Parks head that I showed earlier. Um, and this needed a support shell, but because we were casting these hollow, we had to be able to pick this up and rotate this around. And if this was made of plaster, it would have been really, really heavy. So these support shells were able to be made out of, uh, out of the free form. They're only about a quarter of an inch thick, but they're really strong and really, really lightweight. So that's pretty great. So if you've got large sculptures of things too, things that need to fly um, or maybe trees or that kind of thing that you wanna be able to sculpt quickly, you can get large quantities of that stuff and be able to work with it really fast. Um, so then the Apoxy company, this Aves company that makes this, um, epoxy has been around for a long time. So they make epoxy clay, epoxy sculpt, um, and then they have a couple other, other products. Their epoxy clay, I think, is very close to Magic Sculpt. And then their epoxy sculpt is very close to this one. So uh, the clay one is a little bit more fluffy, a little easier to work with. Um, but again, there's so many different versions of these. So if you can get your hands on these or any of them, just try any and all of them until you figure out what it is that you like. Um, one of the things that I like um, about this was they had one that was called Paste. So this Fix It um, is sort of marketed for repairs of things, but this paste could be kind of really smoothed on to things and, uh, and smooth stuff out. So I, I tried that a little bit. It's not like liquidy, but, ooh, but it's a little bit way, way more viscous. We're, we're less viscous than our other stuff, but still very thick. So that's an option. And then one of the other ones that I really like is just their regular fix it. Um, this I've used for some sculptures that I've made for my yard because this product specifically is freeze and thaw stable. 
So uh, it can deal with where I am in the Northeast. It can deal with our winters and also deal with the, the hot of the summer um, and not shrink or uh, expand too much and not, and not crack. And also uh, uh, it's got a little bit of UV resistance in it. So if you're doing something for outside for a long time, this product might be very interesting to you. Um, okay, and then the last thing about epoxy putties before we go into questions um, are, you know, these are mostly available from um, craft suppliers. You can sometimes get magic sculpts or epoxy from Michael's or, or a hobby store or something, um, but most of the time you have to order these. So you can also get from the regular hardware store, these little epoxy sticks. So these often are with the glue and sometimes have um, very specific uh, 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 applications that they're used for. So for example, this is like marine epoxy. And then this one was like plumber's epoxy, but often these come in a little stick. And here, I'll take the end off, check this out. So it's a little stick that sort of looks like a little tootsie roll, but it has a different color on the inside. And so this is formulated so that you can just slice um, down this way and however much you slice off, you've got the perfect ratio of what's in the middle and what's on the outside and then you just mush them together and then you can use that. So if for some reason you can't get to the regular craft store to get any of these big things and you need an epoxy putty to fix something, there's a whole bunch of versions of these at the hardware store. There's one specifically that has steel in it. So uh, if you need something to be magnetic, that's really helpful. Um, uh, that you can add a little sort of magnetic dot to something um, by adding some of the steel epoxy uh, to it. But also, um, you know, I've had handles break on my old metal teapots and you can kind of put them back together with the steel epoxy. Um, these are also really great for uh, fixing furniture. So we all kind of know, we can see kind of behind me, we've got these upholstery projects that we're working on in my shop. Um, and as you start to take a, a furniture apart, sometimes the wood just disintegrates, right? So there's uh, these epoxy putties can be put into the wood to stabilize them. And I included on the uh, resource sheet, a product called Sculpt Wood. That's basically an epoxy putty that comes in different wood colors and is formulated to put into wood framing um, it, or cracks in furniture. And then uh, uh, it's either the color of your wood or um, it can also, some of them can even be stained over. So those are really great when you're doing wood repair projects. Um, how are we doing on questions? Are there a ton in there? I've got like maybe two other little things to show, but then we could jump into, into questions. So one of the other things that, that um, epoxy putties are really great uh, is if you're pretty nerdy like me and, and my household, so um, my husband really loves to make modified toys. So here's some toys that existed that he sculpted with the epoxy putty onto the bodies that existed already and kind of modified them to smooth them out or to add things. So again, these, um, the magic sculpts um, is what we use, but you can get really, really tiny little details. And we'll see if I can get these little ones to show on my paper, but so. Um, we also love modifying our, our uh, board games. And so we had a, a, there was a Jurassic Park game that we had that, you know, these are the plate pieces that it came with. And I mean, like, look how lame, right? These things are. So we used um, little, uh, uh, my husband got the little people that you get with train sets and started with those and then used the magic sculpts. Let's get this out of this bag to make these tiny, tiny little people. That's so amazing. So, you know, like this whole coat and everything was all sculpted with magic sculpt on there. So you can get really, really fine detail with these. Um, okay, so we've got about 10 minutes left. So why don't we jump over to questions? What's everybody, what's everybody got? Well, first of all, I just want to say this has been fantastic, Jen, and thanks for that. We have a couple of questions, mm -hmm. um, just in no particular order. If you're using different hardnesses of oil plays together, how do you recycle for future products? Do you mix it together or try to separate it and, and get You can mix them together, but then you kind of just wind up with like medium, <laughs> you right. know? So I would recommend that um, uh, if you're going to do a project out of soft use all soft you know if you have to 
um, you know, do kind of soft for the main thing and then hard for some of the other details, you can do that, but you're probably not going to be able to peel them apart later on. So you can just kind of massage them together and then you would get a middle of the road. If you know that you're going to use one for the whole project, then I would recommend just keeping them in very well labeled bags or containers and trying to keep them separate. I will admit that I am bad at this. So most of my bin is like, mm, I don't know. So when I get new stuff, I try to keep it separate. Um, but eventually it kind of all just becomes medium. <laughs> so if I know that I need a specific density, I usually get more of that specific density so that I know that's what I'm working with. <laughs> Yeah, so keep them separate if possible. Yeah. One of the other questions was, um, what kind of sculpting tools do you prefer to use or do you just use your hands? Oh, to add? so for big sculptures, um, and again with the water-based clay, I often will start with my hands and use my hands. Um, we could probably do, and maybe we should do, a whole spaminar on sculpting tools. Um, I love like the little loop tools, the ones that kind of cut. Um, there's ones that kind of scrape that you can kind of are like a little rake. Um, kind of what made the texture in this, see how this kind of looks great yeah. and it's not perfectly smooth, almost like it's a fork. Um, yeah. You can buy those, but I've made a lot of them where I buy a loop tool and then take a Dremel and kind of cut my own little things into it. Um, I've also seen people make those out of um, saw blades, like the tiny little coping saw blades and kind of sanding half the thing off and making a little rake out of that. Um, but again, there's a million different shapes of tools. So again, I can't recommend enough just getting some clay and getting a bunch of tools and seeing what you like the best. You know, I like there's one shape that kind of is like an oblong. It's like my, my favorite tool has a, has a round end. And on the other end, it's got kind of a uh, like a spear shape. It's got one flat side and it's got a little point. But that right. works really well. Like I like that with my right hand, you know. If you're left-handed, there might be a different tool that you like, you yeah. know? So there's flat tools and there's these really great, um, they call them like color shapers or silicone shapers that are like silicone end tools. Those are really wonderful uh, in your final smoothing to be able to smooth things out. So uh, uh, I, I was going to bring in like my drawer of sculpting tools, but I thought that might actually be too much. Right. Um, uh, yeah, when I finally combined all of my tools from art school, when I stopped moving, I realized, oh my God, I've got so many tools. But but I, I can see a couple folks saying, you know, it doesn't have to be anything special. Kitchen tools, you know, forks, spoons, knives, pick up a couple at, at a thrift store and designate them as your as your play tools. You know, don't use the ones that you um, uh, eat with, you know, and for the oil-based clay and the water-based clay, you can clean those off. When you use any tools for your um, epoxy clays, try to keep them separate and clean them as soon as you're done. Because if that stuff hardens on there, that's gonna change the You're shape. done, yeah, you can, game over. You know, uh, uh, you can sand it away later, but then it might change the shape of your tool. You know, so that's also why the, the um, silicone edge tools are actually really great for that because it doesn't cure on, the, you know, you can let it cure and then kind of just snap it off the silicone. So, right. but there, there's a, a million out there um, but I, I often like the ones that kind of have a little loop on them. Yeah, the ba the basic uh, I, when I when I was throwing pottery, the basic potter's set that you get that's got like six or seven tools yeah. in it, yeah. and you just use them over and over again. Yeah, um, and, and often Patrick, what happens is you've got a million tools, and then you wind up using three of them. You know, like or you, you or, oh, look at all these great shapes, and then actually, you know, two or three of them do all the things you need. To right, do. or, but or some a people tongue really depressor, like all yeah. the variety. So again, it's really personal preference. Exactly. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Patrick threw in popsicle sticks are great. They can be sharpened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, somebody is asking about, somebody asked about the cure time on the epoxy clay, clays. Mm -hmm. I think you had initially said, oh, is that overnight? Is that the one uh, that you Yeah, said? so they'll, they're kind of working time, depending on the product, is usually between half an hour to an hour and a half that you have to really kind of mess with them. And then they kind of get unworkable, but they're not cured. So right. then, you know, you really have to wait, I would recommend at least overnight until it was something that you put on stage. These aren't like five minute epoxy, right? Where you right. can do the thing and throw it on stage. Um, uh, to get a really good cure, you want them to cure overnight. Yeah. Uh, one more question that just occurred to the pot, the epoxy clays have fumes. So some of them do have a strong smell. I would recommend using them, uh, uh, you know, somewhere with a, with a fan. If you can have a window open, that's great, but they're not so strong that you have to have 
crazy ventilation or you have to use them outside. It's not like spray paint. Um, right. uh, again, I, I wouldn't recommend like, you know, closing yourself in your bathroom <laughs> right. and, and using them. Um, but different, different versions of them smell stronger. So I think that's also why I tend to really like the magic sculpt is I like stick my nose. This one, I mean, the, the hardener of this has a little bit of a smell, but it's not as strong as the other ones. The epoxy yeah. sculpt, the, the, or the, the, um, freeform sculpt, the freeform air even has a stronger smell. So I think out of most of them. The, the magic sculpt has the least smell in my opinion. Um, but right. again, there might be something that might bother you about one of them that doesn't about the other. Well, so. and I think the other safe rule is if it has a fragrance, assume that's not benign, you know, yes. that, that like, just because it doesn't, you know, make you crazy, go nuts while right. you're working yes, with exactly. it. Don't assume so, it's yeah. Yeah. safe. So at, right. at a minimum, when I'm using these, I almost always have a fan kind of not pointing at my face, but kind of pointing right. sideways. So it's blowing away. Right. Um, for me, and then, you know, if I can have the window open, that's great. Okay, we've got time for maybe like one more question if anybody has anything. If not, I'm going to just say thank you, Jen. This was amazing. Yeah, no Thanks problem. For... Yeah, there, there's, there's tons of other stuff. We didn't even touch on, you know, paper mache or, or like paper mache pulps and all those kind of things. So right. I think that, that could easily be another one. Um, well, your like resource I, sheet is unbelievable. Great. So, well, that's I mean, wonderful. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's only scratching the surface. So again, I can't stress enough just trying to get your hands on, on any of this. And really the playing with this stuff ahead of time, ahead of doing the, the real project, is right. what can be Don't really wait until valuable. you have to do it. Yeah. You know, because then when you do the real project, you kind of know, oh, this is the thing I like. You know, so anytime you have a spare amount of time or if you've got a couple extra bucks in your budget, you know, get another one of these things and then just play with it sometime, you know, um, uh, whether again, it's the water-based play or, or any of these, you know, have a party with your friends and have everybody get one product and then share them, right? So you only have to invest in the one and then you can kind of uh, uh, switch them between each other and kind of share them and, and learn what they feel like. Um, uh, that would be great. Invite me to that party because that would be really fun. Um, but, but yeah, just getting the, you know, the small sizes of these things. A lot of them have small, small versions. So you don't have to invest in a giant thing. You know, these are probably less than $20. So, right. you know, get, get some of these, and, and, you know, keep notes for yourself, kind of play with them and be like, hmm, this one's kind of sticky. Oh, I don't like the way that this one sticks to my tools. Oh, this one dries faster, you know, kind of do a right. little experiment for yourself. Um, but knowing that before you get into the project is really what's going to then have you pick the right thing for the project. Right. Well, I just want to add, I'm going to throw in here, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Links are in chat. Um, speaking of those channels, you can stay tuned to hear more about our upcoming webinars. Um, on September 18th, we'll be taking a look at the iconic props from Sweeney Todd with prop managers from different productions. Uh, then on October 16th, we'll dive into a subject that is near and dear to my heart, uh, uh, blood and guts and vomit and gore with a discussion, with a panel discussion on how we created those effects for the stage. And then our last webinar of the year for on November 13th, just in time for Thanksgiving, is we're cooking up a session about consumable food on stage that we're calling, I have to eat what? And that's gonna be made up of a panel of, of our uh, crazy geniuses um, who make food for the stage. Uh, now, some of you are probably wondering how to become a member of SPAM if you are a working prop manager, director, supervisor, master, or some similar title in a nonprofit theater or opera company, or an educator who teaches prop classes and prepares students for a career in props, and you're interested in joining SPAM, please send our membership committee an email for more information. The address is super easy to remember. It's membership at propmanagers.org. That's membership at propmanagers.org. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, and, and, uh, and also talk to us there. Um, we also have the Facebook page, uh, Props for the Stage and Beyond, man, uh, managed by SPAM. Spaminar is produced by the Society of Props Artisans and Managers with special thanks to SPAM members, Patrick Drone, the Props Supervisor and Lecturer at the University of Michigan, me, 
I'm, the, I'm, I'm Larry Heyman, and I'm an Associate Professor of Props Design and Technology at Oklahoma City University. Ben Holman, the Props Director at the Utah Shakespeare Festival, Stacey Horn Harper, Props Master at Salem State University, Nikki Kulis, Prop Master at First Stage, Amy Peter, Prop Master at the Theater School at DePaul University, Karen Rabe Vance, Head of Props at, at the Guthrie Theater, and thanks once again to the amazing Jennifer McClure for this fantastic evening. Um, once again, please keep your suggestions for future Spaminars coming. We want to know what you want to learn about. That's all I got for you this evening, folks. Props on, prop on, and we'll see you next time.